So hello and welcome and thank you for joining us in today's special webinar by the National Organization for Rare Disorders, NORD, on crisis communications, COVID-19 and the future. This webinar is part of our COVID-19 Rapid Response Leadership Series. My name is Debbie Drell and I'm NORD's Membership Director and I'm your facilitator for today's webinar. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. All lines are muted except for our speaker. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available shortly after with a link posted to our COVID-19 Rapid Response Leadership Series webpage. If you're one of the near 700 leaders of our 320 member organizations, you will also receive the webinar recording link in NORD's weekly member e-newsletter, and we also post it to our special Facebook group for our member organizations. If you want to learn more about NORD's membership for nonprofit organizations, you can reach out to a member of our team. NORD's mission is your mission if you're a rare disease nonprofit organization leader. During this webinar, an issue raised or topic discussed may prompt you to think of a question that doesn't get specifically addressed. Maybe it's too specific. Maybe it is communication, but not crisis communication. Email us, membership at rarediseases.org. We'll help answer your question if we can. We'll redirect you to the right place. NORD's new COVID-19 Rapid Response Leadership Series. So we learned from our 320 member organizations that COVID-19 has created substantial obstacles for your organization, specifically rapidly changing demands on your infrastructure, including telework, cancellations of fundraisers, conferences, impact on your clinical trials getting closed or postponed. And we heard you. Uh, NORD launched our COVID-19 Rapid Response Leadership Series to meet these emerging needs. We are expanding our capacity building and our membership support services. We're actually opening it up to non-members because it's so important right now during this pandemic, something we haven't seen for 100 years um, and something that is really devastating to nonprofit organizations. So let's get to our presentation on the agenda. Uh, you will see the agenda. I'm just given a brief uh, introduction and we'll introduce our keynote speaker and if there's time we'll have Q&A. Uh, how do you ask a question? If you're watching the slides now and you're using the Zoom browser, there's a Q&A button located at the bottom of your window, of your Zoom window, and that's the meetings control bar. So you can actually click on the Q&A, you can submit your question and type them in there. Now if you submit anything to the chat, sometimes the chat is a high-speed treadmill of words and it can be challenging for us to identify your question. So please use the Q&A box for your questions. Uh, there is also closed captioning, and I realize I'm speaking really quickly, so I'm sorry, Katie, who is our closed caption assistant, who's typing uh, closed caption, um, but you can left click on closed caption and click on show subtitle. I'm slowing down significantly as I realize we do have a closed caption or live closed captioning. So it's slightly more accurate than uh, one that's auto-generated from an app. Um, so this is something we have done because our members have asked for it and because we want to make our webinars and meetings accessible. So on to Nord's mission. Nord's mission is your mission. Nord is an independent nonprofit. We're leading the fight to improve the lives of rare disease patients and families. That's 30 million Americans living with rare diseases. And we do this with accelerating research, we provide education, we disseminate information, and we definitely drive public policy. Uh, leaders of our organizations are entitled to all the resources Nord provides. Um, so after all of that, I am so grateful to present our keynote speaker, Michael Williams. He is the Media Relations and Journalism Senior Consultant at Board Veritas. He coaches board members to become powerful ambassadors of their boards, and he strengthens their ability as advocates and evangelists, and evangelists for their organizational mission. Michael hosts and produces Board Veritas' original podcast called Board Straight. I love the name. Michael is known as an astute commentator in the political world. He's a moderator for the flagship current events program of Voice of America. It's called Issues in the News, and it's heard by over 19 million listeners every week. His experience in radio, radio and television established him as one of the industry's most trusted sources on a variety of issues, including crisis communications. And without further ado, I am so excited to bring Michael on. 
Well, Debbie, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction and welcome to everyone who's uh, listening and hopefully we'll be able to bring you uh, some, some knowledge, some insight and some tools for managing uh, what uh, is a very uh, unusual and challenging situation here with COVID-19 for, for everyone. Every organization is facing challenges. So uh, sometimes you may feel alone in this, but you are certainly uh, not alone. There are a lot of people who are facing the same challenges. We want to give you some of the tools to, uh, to go over that. Um, as I, I told Debbie, we could do this for a weekend retreat and easily spend every minute of that time and send you home with tools and a, a lovely set of parting gifts for that matter. But uh, it said we we're trying to give you uh, some basic tools during this, uh, uh, during this short time. Uh, so I want to go over the uh, learning objectives of what we want to get to here, which is to really understand the basics of uh, crisis communication through some practical examples that will set out uh, a couple that show how uh, not handling things properly can get you in some big trouble and, and one that shows how uh, facing up and using the right uh, principles properly can serve you well. Um, learning what it means to triage a crisis. That means to, uh, for those who aren't familiar, I, I bet most of you are familiar with that, uh, with that term, but uh, to triage and manage and assess the urgency of a crisis that's uh, essential in having your leadership be able to handle it properly. Uh, recognizing the three pillars of crisis communications. We identify those in the communications world. I want to share those with you and show why they're so integral to successfully navigating through a crisis. Um, we want to uh, show you how a crisis can be an opportunity. And um, there really is a, a chance for some organizations to make, to make gains, to make substantial gains um, during these times of, of change and of challenge. That's usually where some growth can occur. So we wanna give you an opportunity to see how those things can happen, especially in becoming a trusted source of information. We'll spend a lot of time on that. And we wanna gain strategies on engaging your board of directors, uh, including uh, who should comment, who shouldn't, and certainly how uh, they, should, they should comment. So next slide. Um, so uh, let's give these practical examples of, uh, of the good, the bad, and the ugly of crisis communications. And let's go over what does a crisis look like? Let's define it. Let's uh, define crisis status for your individual organizations and determine what's at stake. Let's see how that works with three practical examples. Let's go to the first example where we have um, wounded warriors. Uh, and uh, wounded warriors... I think you know is a uh, a nonprofit that helps uh, uh, people who have been in the military have been wounded uh, in service, and it was meant to provide educational opportunities, um, uh, reassimilation back into society. It was a very noble and useful mission they had at Wounded Warriors, and it gained quite a lot of growth and quite a lot of. Uh, of, of support in the aftermath of 9-11, of course, I think is when it started. And um, with the missions that have been, with the ongoing uh, foreign wars in the United States, it's gained a lot of traction, it gained a lot of attention, and gained a lot of support. But in 2016, uh, CBS News and the, and the New York Times published stories levying accusations that the nonprofit was wasting donor money. Um, the Times wrote, it has spent millions a year on travel dinners, hotels, and conferences that often seemed more lavish than appropriate with more than uh, four dozen current and former employees giving interviews to the Times alleging uh, these transgressions. Um, employees specifically questioned the organization spending to take hundreds of the organization's employees, hundreds of employees now, this is a large organization we're talking about, if you think about it, to have even hundreds of employees available to waste money on. <laughs> they have such a large organization. They took hundreds of these employees to a conference at a Colorado resort. Um, I know the resort, it shall remain nameless and blameless because it's not their fault. Uh, they alleged that the nonprofit spent nearly $3 million on one retreat uh, with some describing a party with excessive food, drink, and uh, I'll say fun, all uh, fueled by donor funds. I know that at this particular event, one of the highlights was, I believe, the uh, CEO of the organization um, sort of rappelling down from a helicopter that was hovering over one of the events and then making a grand entrance like this with the helicopter costing, you know, 
uh, tens of thousands of dollars just for you know, that one moment in the sun. So what's the aftermath here? What's the response? The nonprofit first, at first denied the allegations and uh, they demanded uh, retractions from the media. So the blame the media first, this can't be true. How dare they uh, deny, deny, deny. Uh, but the organization uh, had to face the facts because there were so many people from within the organization who were actually supplying the information to the media. They weren't making it up. Um, they soon fired several uh, key leaders, one of whom had been making uh, $473,000 a year in salary and another who was making $369,000 a year according to tax documents. Now, I don't get into the business of counting other people's money, but when you're taking um, an organization's money in terms of salary and you're also spending 10 times that amount of these very generous salaries on one lavish uh, employee outing, clearly you are leaving yourself open to reputational disaster. I think anyone could see that. So according to the uh, Washington Post, the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving uh, Alliance um, and an oversight uh, entity suspended the charity's uh, uh, designation um, and donations plummeted uh, and probably rightfully so. In September, 2016, about 85 employees were laid off. Uh, the organization was forced to restructure. I think that they have since gained some of their stature back, but the, the lot losses at that time were, were tremendous. They were severe. And um, what was the cost? Millions in revenue, uh, federal scrutiny. Uh, and I can't think of anything more scary for a nonprofit organization than to be scrutinized by um, the IRS or even worse, a congressional committee. Uh, um, it, it is, it's terrifying. I, I've prepared people for this thing and it's something that you don't wanna do. Honestly, you really don't wanna be sitting in front of those people having to explain transgressions like this. Um, and probably most difficult and uh, most uh, difficult to recover is the uh, reputation of the organization. Uh, it recovered to some extent, but it'll never be viewed in the same way. There'll always be a patina of skepticism that goes when you say wounded warriors, oh, good mission, but isn't that the guy? Aren't those the guys who did such and such? And that leads people to the search for the, uh, an organization that has a similar mission, but you know, does not have the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the scar tissue uh, on their reputation that this one does. Uh, let's go to case study two, where we have the, uh, MIT Media Lab and Jeffrey Epstein, this is uh, somewhat more recent, somewhat more fresh in the memory, but we'll go over um, the issues and then the cost as we did before uh, with Wounded Warriors. Uh, in early of August, 2019, it was revealed that the nonprofit had uh, accepted donations over the years from Jeffrey Epstein, who is now um, just a reviled name um, as uh, a sexual offender, sex trafficker. Um, he is uh, obviously just a person whose name reeks with scandal and every name that touches his uh, essentially takes on, you know, that, that same odor. You're going to get touched by this guy. If you've dealt with him, it's not good for you. Um, a whistleblower. And again, notice how these transgressions come from internal, that people who are of good conscience and have the best uh, intentions for the mission and satisfying the mission of the organization. They're the ones who are coming forward and saying that this is a problem. Uh, a whistleblower and MIT employees went on the record with uh, a New Yorker writer by the name of Ronan Farrow, who just happens to be uh, Woody Allen's son. Uh, and the article was called How an Elite University Research Center Concealed Its Relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. Now, isn't it interesting that you don't even have to say anything you only have to look at that article, that title, and know Concealed and Jeffrey Epstein and know how accusatory and how damaging I think is going to be just by the title alone. I mean, you don't even have to read the article and you've been damaged. Um, the investigation revealed that Epstein was responsible for large amounts of funding to MIT, uh, also exceeding the original amounts that were reported uh, in August. Um, and it is, uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, MIT's media base, he was, he was uh, donating despite his disqualified status in its donor database. So somebody had to take the initiative to say, even though he is a, uh, a discredited uh, donor, we want to take his money 
clearly money was more important than the mission, was more important than honor, was more important than any of his conduct. And uh, how many people, you know, in history get in trouble while, while valuing money over proper conduct? That's a, that's a very long list. That's a very long line to get in. Um, Pharaoh's uh, reporting included uh, internal documents, again, information coming within, including emails between uh, uh, Ido, the director, and uh, Peter Cohen, the uh, MIT Media Lab's director of development. Um, so the cost, Ido uh, was uh, forced to resign 24 hours after Pharaoh's story, Pharaoh's story was published uh, to uh, researchers, essential researchers, a lot, uh, resigned from the Media Lab. Um, and they cited Ito's relationship with Epstein as a reason for their departure. Um, so you have key staff. If we look at the differences in, in the cost between this and Wounded Warrior. One of the big differences is the key staff that left it uh, on their own, you know, of their own accord and saying, we don't want to be, even, even though you have trained us, we love this mission, we love what this organization does, we don't want to be a part of this. We can't be a part of it because it sullies who we are. Uh, so they've lost key staff. And imagine you have staff who you've trained, you've trained in your mission, you've trained them to do their job, you've trained them to be effective in a, multi, a, a variety of different ways, multiple ways, and all of a sudden they say, I'm sorry, uh, we can't do this anymore. It it's, could be catastrophic, uh, especially if you're a smaller organization to have the key staff walk out the door. Uh, revenue from donors for any organization, you don't want to see donor uh, levels dropping. I, and you know, regardless, 50% is 50% for any organization. You start losing uh, donors and the ability to uh, recruit donors in the future, you're going to be in trouble. So this was a huge deal for them. And again, the reputation, uh, the MIT uh, lab, the media lab had a sterling re reputation uh, in the academic world, in the business world for that matter. And all that is gone. And it remains sully to this day. So again, I, I feel like reputation is the one that you want to uh, protect first and foremost, because with that you can build, that's sort of the soil that you can plant seeds with in your organization. But if you don't have reputation, where are you going to put anything else? Uh, your innovation, your development, where does any of that go? If you don't have the reputation and you don't have the faith and confidence uh, uh, from people that you can actually do it and fulfill your mission, that all starts with reputation. Um, let's go to the third uh, case study, which is uh, a little while ago. I admit that I am old enough to uh, remember when this happened. Uh, some of you might be out there. Uh, so this is the Tylenol scandal. And uh, just to go over it very quickly, in uh, 1982, a wave of cyanide poisonings uh, shook uh, Chicago. Uh, and the, uh, someone was putting Tylenol on, uh, t was putting cyanide on Tylenol tablets uh, and leaving the bottles in stores so that they could be purchased. Um, between September and October of 1982, there were seven deaths that resulted uh, from people taking Tylenol that had been laced with cyanide. Um, in the panic that ensued from that, Tylenol's market share uh, in the U.S. over-the-counter painkiller market went from 35%. Imagine for one painkiller, you, you know when you go into the CVS or um, the Walgreens or any of these stores, when you go to the painkiller section, and I go there far too often, sadly, um, you, you, you see these rows and rows of options and uh, 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 these, these, these painkillers, all sorts of things. To imagine one brand, one brand having 35% of the market. I mean, that represents billions of dollars. Market share plunged from 35% to 8% overnight. This is a stunning transition. So what did Tylenol do? Um, <clears throat> we did not know, they did not know at the time that the incident was limited to the Chicago area. The police thought that it was. They, they, they had a suspicion that it was. But the CEO of Johnson & Johnson ordered the company to pull all of their product from all U.S. shelves, even though there wasn't um, forensic proof that there were other uh, uh, poisonings or other, other tamperings that were happening elsewhere in the country. Um, so that's more than 31 million containers were pulled from U.S. shelves. Stunning number again. Uh, Johnson & Johnson's gave a very forthright response in that sense. And um, they also spent $100 million on tamper-proof packaging. Now, there was not a lot of that, if any, before 1982. Everything used to be like the easily screw-off bottles. 
And if you wonder where those difficult to open bottles came from for drugs, that's Tylenol. They're the ones who, who, who popularized that. So it's fascinating that they, uh, that, that was the impetus for something that actually has done a lot of good in society, prevented poisonings and kids getting into bottles and things like that. Um, so they, they pulled their product from the shelves. They uh, created the tamper-proof packaging to convince the public that their product would be safe going forward. Within a year, a year, Tylenol regained its number one market position. That is a stunning turnaround. And I think uh, in terms of how a corporation or any type of organization uh, should behave in times of crisis, um, that Tylenol response is still considered the gold standard. When you talk about leadership uh, in a crisis situation, when you talk about honesty, the, utilizing the three pillars of crisis communication, which we'll go over in a minute, this is, again, the gold standard. So from there, let's define a crisis because these, again, are large organizations, and uh, I have obviously not met you all. I'm not familiar with every organization uh, that I'm speaking to, but I know that there are some that are large, some that are small, some maybe um, single person entities who have a passion uh, for helping out uh, uh, in that one particular uh, uh, particular disease. So everybody's uh, doing something that they want to be doing and anyone can face a crisis, large companies, small companies. So we just wanted to, I wanted to lay out some of the uh, definitions of what uh, a crisis could be. And we'll finish with some of the COVID specific ones that we're seeing now. Um, so it could be financial rows, rows such as layoffs and bankruptcy, um, employee wrongdoing, sexual harassment is sort of a common thing that we see if that happens at a high enough, a high enough level or if frequently enough, um, it hits the media and it becomes catastrophic. Um, natural disasters, of course, you know, floods, fires, hurricanes, uh, storms, these things can present a physical disaster. If your physical plant, if your, your, there are things that you work with are actually wiped out, how do you respond to that as an organization? Um, worse closures due to an, uh, an illness or death. This is especially uh, prevalent where you have a family run organization or foundation, say, where the, the mission largely resides within the, the visionary leadership of one individual person and you somehow lose that person. What do you do? Who's there to carry on uh, the mission? Um, reputation issues. And I think we just went through a couple of those with the uh, previous uh, with the previous examples. And I wanted to get to a couple of the COVID specific issues and Debbie, feel free to, to chime in uh, to, on, on these as they relate specifically to, to, to this uh, constituency. Um, things like a delayed clinical trial, we talked about that when if you, because COVID-19 has arrested uh, all activity, you have a clinical trial that was going to be a breakthrough and represent an opportunity to, um, to, to, to help people you know, through, the, uh, through the therapy or the medication in the trial but also uh, this is something that helps you to uh, further your donor base. People are counting on you and waiting on the result of this so that you can further your mission, further your donor base. What if you have canceled fundraising event? And I work some with the world of golf. And I know that, you know, basically for this entire year, you can forget about the charity golf tournament. That's over. Okay. Um, it, it, the idea there is to get a bunch of people together in a room and have them interact, you know, and have them have a good time, have a positive experience, have that positive experience relate to the cause that you're talking about, and then you go with the, with the donor base. But now, how do you do those things? You know, do you do it virtually? Do you do it uh, by mail? Do you do it by phone? Do you ask people to wait until next year? How do you hold on to that thing? And by the way, you have a lot of people, what do we have, 40 million people who are filed for unemployment now? How much of your donor base is on unemployment now? Um, we have to be mindful. We can't just you know, uh, callously say, we need more money when you have people who are suffering on the other end too. So you have to be very mindful of how you, how you, uh, how you phrase uh, your appeals, you know, with those situations. And cybersecurity issues. I think this is one that goes in during COVID-19 and uh, all day, every day. We've seen organizations long, uh, large and small who have had their data stolen, have had cyber breaches, your information has been compromised. And um, this is one that oddly, though it's almost blameless, you know, because you can do everything that you can do technically and still get hit because there's people who are out there who are really bad guys who are relentlessly working for how to get other people's information. And sometimes they do, but people are pretty unforgiving of that. Somehow when that breach happens, the organization 
that uh, gets hit is somehow thought to be careless. It's thought to be, uh, uh, you should have prevented this happening. You should have known, and you should have been able to do this. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it just happens. You know, there are bad burglars out there. So how to overcome those sorts of situations. Debbie, did you want to chime in on, on any of those? You covered it really well. Um, I will say um, I threw in the chat to everybody, if anybody wants to throw in, in the chat any crises, if they feel comfortable sharing that. But when the coronavirus hit, we heard from one of our members who said on on March 15th, the day that this, that her state and where her organization was founded, went under quarantine or stay-at-home orders, the donations went to a screeching halt. And the individual donors were their biggest contribution. So they just had a, a massive revenue drop because of the coronavirus before any people just got scared about what this meant for their income. And with unemployment now, um, you know, I think there's some fear around asking for donations. So everything yeah. you said is, is pretty accurate. And with clinical trials, doctor, researchers can't go into the lab. Patients can't go to the lab to get their blood drawn or they can't go travel to their site, their uh, clinical trial site. So a lot of them were postponed or delayed indefinitely. And those are some crises for our organizations because the patients are, could potentially die if they don't have access. So the patients are coming to the organization saying, what can you do? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think there, there's probably so many more out there with so many people out there with these organizations, people will be able to, uh, to identify others. But again, in the limited time that we have, um, I wanted to just spotlight a couple of those and then respond in, in, in the most helpful uh, fashion, being general and specific at the same time, if we can say that. Uh, so let's go then to um, these three pillars of uh, crisis communications. And um, let's go over these quickly, but, um, but thoroughly. Um, and they should be really straightforward. And they, I, I'm gonna say that for most leaders who are effective leaders, these are a part of your personal profile anyway. You'll find that people who do these things are effective leaders anyway, and they become even more important in a crisis. So the first one is honesty. Um, if you see the first uh, uh, examples that we had, the first two examples, there was some some level of, of subterfuge there. There was some level of people trying to hide wrongdoing. And once it was discovered, even when it was discovered legitimately and accurately, and people were showing legitimate documents to prove it, uh, they were still denying that things happened. This never works. It never works. Honesty with, and I'll say honesty uh, internally, as far as your own organization, that means honest communication between your board and your, um, and your uh, executive, executives in the corporation or the organization, making sure that people understand that they have to tell each other the truth or they will not be able to get through this crisis. Everybody has to be on the same page. So that means not withholding, not wanting to say, there's sometimes a, uh, a tendency to want to uh, withhold information from one group or the other, the board or the executives, because we, said, we don't want to upset that guy or we don't want to upset the apple carter. He doesn't need to know yet. You need to fight all those instincts and be honest and transparent. Okay. I think those two actually really go together. They're, they're uh, sort of flavors of the same thing. Uh, transparency, meaning get all the documents out there. Um, get all of the information out there. Don't keep anything tucked in a drawer. Don't say, well, this one is even worse. If, if people knew about this, this thing, this amount, this deed, uh, then the crisis would be even worse. So I'm just going to hide it in a drawer because there's always tentacles that will lead people to that drawer. And what's worse, bringing it out on your own, explaining and dealing with it, or having someone find it and you having to ask the question about why you had, why, why did you have that in a locked drawer? It's, it's, it's never good. It just, it never works out. I defy anyone to give me an example where that does. And when we say frequency, um, this is something that is uh, subjective, I will admit. But as frequently as possible, as your, as your organization's infrastructure will allow, update your information during a crisis. Um, you've already, you, if you've admitted you have a crisis, you're in communications with your constituents, with your patients, with your donors, with your board, with your internal staff, whatever may, it may be, 
update your information frequently, as frequently as you can. Maybe it's daily. If you're a um, skilled and practiced user of social media, maybe that means hourly. Maybe you're doing that on the hour through your social media, but still with the filters of it has to be honest and it has to be transparent. So doing things frequently and giving dishonest answers or half truths on a frequent basis does not get it done. Frequency doesn't solve everything. You'll see a lot of people who try to bury uh, the issue, they try to like dominate the news cycle with one thing after another, after another, that's so, sort of true, half true, kind of true, everything's gonna be all right. That doesn't work. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it that way, it just doesn't work. So honesty, transparency, and fre transparency and frequency, and again, Understanding that there are some of you out there who are very small organizations, less than some between one and five people, um, that frequency, you know, because you're busy doing everything else, maybe that's weekly. Don't feel bad about that. Um, as much as you can, I would say, is, is, is the answer. And you'll get feedback on whether it's enough and whether you need to bring in other resources that aren't in the organization currently to update that frequency, to uh, scale, upscale that frequency. Um, let's go to who leads in a crisis. There's an old saying, it goes that, uh, I love this saying, and especially when older guys say it, you know, even older than me, uh, <laughs> it goes, them that, them that know won't say, and them that will say don't know. And it means that you have sometimes people in an organization who, um, if they know what's going on, they will guard that information. They won't tell anybody. So them that know won't say. Uh, they are the informers. They're the people who just gather and keep that information tight. Then you have some people who will want to be in front of a microphone, um, who are waiting for the spotlight. And, you know, in this world where you know, fame is uh, held in such high currency, everyone's looking for their 15 minutes. Um, sometimes you'll have, it'll be an employee, maybe a constituent, maybe a doctor in a hospital, maybe a nurse, you know, it could be anybody who says, well, have you heard, uh, a reporter says, have you heard something about this organization or have you heard something about this situation? And they'll say everything that they wanted to a microphone. Well, I heard that or I feel that or whatever, but they don't know anything. They don't have any information. So that's what we say sometimes them that no won't say, them that'll say, don't know. And I think you have to be aware of both of those characters. Um, the three sort of key uh, uh, types, information types that you need in this crisis, we list out here, who are the information gatherers, message crafters, and information disseminators. Description really quickly. Information gatherers are the people who effectively know how to go out and find out what's going on. How's this going? What's going on financially? What's going on in the news? What's going on in social media? What's going on in our own board? What's going on with our uh, constituents? What's going on with our bank, our accounting? People who can get you all the information you need as leaders to be able to make decisions because the number one currency for decision making in leadership is what? Information. The more information you have, the more decision making you get to do or to realize that you don't even have a decision. Sometimes if you have enough information, the decision is laid out for you just as clear as day. There is, the path is sitting right before you. So having those uh, uh, skilled information gatherers is critical. Message crafters, now these are the people who will take that information and again, not give you something that is a half truth, a falsehood, a, a, an excuse. Um, we're not in the, in the business of, we don't wanna be in the business of, um, of, of hiding things. What you wanna be good at is giving people the information they need to know. Um, your information gatherers have done a good job and you've got all of this information at your disposal, but what is key and critical to your message in really solving the crisis? What do people need to know? If they're saying, well, we talked about the uh, clinical trials, when will I be able to get the clinical trial? That's what they wanna know, the answer to that question. They don't wanna know, well, okay, you haven't gotten your curtains yet. You didn't get the upgrade, you know, on the uh, on stereo in the break room. They, you know, all these things are crises, maybe to somebody, but they don't want to know all that. They don't want to know about your troubles. They wanted to have when is this my personal crisis going to be fixed? So you need to have the information, understand how you can craft your message to give them the information that they need to know, give them confidence that uh, you, they are the you are the place, you are the source for that information and that they can come back to you time and time again 
for, for quality information. Now, again, there are smaller organizations out here um, who don't have uh, marketing departments or communications teams. Some do, some don't. You may have specialists in the organization, and sometimes you have uh, you know, the, the, the person who's doing everything. Um, my advice is, look, you can, you can seek some of this information or, or how to, you can seek this instruction on how to do these things. You can go to the internet, you know, and turn on your Google machine and say, how do I, how do I do this? How do I craft a great message? You can use templates for press releases and things like that. Um, if you don't have that skilled person in house and you don't feel comfortable to do it, maybe, maybe you can find the resources to go outside of the shop and find uh, uh, people who can do that. Same goes for information disseminator. So that's someone who's going to stand in front of the microphone, who's going to stand in front of the camera, who's going to uh, uh, give the board presentation and say, here, here, here's what we need to do. Here's what we know. Here's what we need to do. So uh, again, if you don't have an effective communicator, you don't feel like you are an effective communicator. If you're a one person shop, if you're small, do the best you can, you know, and, and, and reach out and, uh, Stand on your pillars, you know, of honesty, transparency, frequency. If you have skilled people, let them do it. Let them do their job. That's what they're trained for. And if you have any doubts about it, come to us at Board Veritas because, you know, we can give you a quick call. We can help you assess um, your issues and maybe uh, we can uh, lend you a hand with that. We can give you training on how to stand in front of a microphone. We can give you some training on how to craft messages and that sort of thing. We do that for organizations large and small. So um, you might want to keep us on speed dial if you, if you have some sort of situation like that, or you feel like you're going to, um, please uh, feel free to do that. Um, let's see. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so again, we could do this as a, a weekend, overnight cabins, you know, great dinner in between, that sort of thing. We ought to do that, as a matter of fact. Maybe we can organize something like that. Um, uh, because I'd love to be able to do things like role plays. And, you know, there's all sorts of tools that we could use to, to really uh, drill down and bring home uh, this message. And also to have you leave the room, you know, with some practice skills for this thing. But uh, since we don't, let's go with uh, giving you some of these nine basic uh, crisis management steps so that you can start to plan uh, for these things in your future. So... The first is recognizing um, the forming crisis and getting ready for action. Um, yeah. So <laughs> the first thing is grab that crisis comms playbook. Again, that's something you would get from our weekend retreat. Um, but knowing this, just knowing this now and going through this particular seminar, what, what do you know from this is that you know you need a crisis comms playbook. So it doesn't have to be a two-inch binder, you know, with 50 tabs. It can be these nine pillars that you start to grow on and start to expand on over time, you know, in your, in your downtime. I mean, now everybody's hustling to deal with this crisis. Use the nine steps. If this is what you have right now, the nine steps we're going to give you, but for the future, make that a plan, put that on your absolute to-do list to come up with that playbook. So that next time you have that emergency, break glass, pull it out and make sure that um, you know it and that your key staff are familiar with it. Um, and as we said before, um, gather any and all information available, both internally and externally, and don't throw anything away. Um, things that don't seem important will seem important. Things that seem too technical for the public to understand, there's media out there who are paid to make them understandable. So um, uh, keep everything, uh, gather everything you can, keep it in one place and uh, be ready to utilize it. To let's, um, let's, oh, we're still on the same slide. Uh, alert the team and uh, provide information. Make sure that the chain of command and communication is clear. And this is easier to do in some organizations than others. This is uh, a point where a small organization may have an advantage because you don't have as many people. You don't have the unavoidable office politics that comes sometimes with large organizations that have both uh, executive boards and a, um, a board of directors. Um, uh, but there has to be agreement. You have to, you have to be able to communicate and understand where the decision making is actually coming from. Okay. Cause this is all about decision making. And uh, again, what board Veritas does, you know, for a living is making sure that you have um, that you have functioning and I mean, well functioning boards, high functioning boards. So those that are uh, functioning well, 
in good times will be well positioned to, to function well you know, in crisis situations. So understanding your chain of command and how the communication gets disseminated is key. And um, again, deciding if your team needs to, to pause any uh, social media posts, client emails, that sort of thing. You may have things that are in the queue on a regular basis, say your weekly email. I think a lot of organizations have that weekly email, that weekly newsletter, that sort of thing. You may want to pause that and replace that with, hey, this is our blank, our COVID-19 newsletter. And you can put some of your, um, your normal uh, uh, information pieces in there, but to make sure that people understand that you're addressing this and you're not distracted by the day to day. Um, you need to prove to people that you're, you're recognizing that there's a crisis and addressing it in the way that you ought to be. Um, develop your messaging. Um, again, we, we talked about this before a little bit, but knowing the, uh, uh, the relevant points to uh, communicate internally and externally. And again, in a longer situation, we go over for, a, I would go over for a long time, uh, the difference between internal communications and external communications, when you have the media to deal with, when you have customers to deal with, as opposed to having employees to deal with, having board members or executive boards to deal with. All of these constituencies, constituencies are relying on leadership to be decisive, to be informed, to be honest, transparent, all the things that we talked about, but they need it uh, in, in, in very different ways. Um, so understand the differences between these audiences and give them each what they need in the way that they need it. Um, and I would say establishing a spokesperson and a source of truth where you can direct uh, traffic uh, in a uh, tra traffic to a blog post. It could be um, a, uh, a, a weekly uh, uh, video. It could be a daily video. I think that we talked about a great example uh, of, of this being uh, Andrew Cuomo during the COVID-19 crisis, because before that, I think, you know, he's a well-known family name and probably his younger brother, Chris, was better known um, as an individual before that because he had his nightly national television show. But uh, before this crisis, Andrew Cuomo was about as unknown outside of New York as a governor of New York can be. But within the crisis, he, he gave a, a daily briefing that was remarkable in its honesty, in its clarity of information, in its insightfulness, in its, um, the sense that he cared. There's a heartfelt sense of him, a sense of empathy, uh, a sense of competence. That, that came through, a sense of no nonsense, a New Yorker in the best possible way is what he presented himself as. And he did that for 110 straight days. And I, I, as a person who goes on TV, I can't tell you how remarkable it is that he did that and did that so effectively. It left an impression that this is the guy you want in charge of things, anything. I mean, we're at crisis. You want him in, in charge on a day-to-day -day basis, on a crisis basis. Um, this is a guy that you can go to. He made himself a trusted source of information. Um, and uh, again, uh, there'll be studies, there'll be theses written about uh, what he did during that thing. But I think he's, he's a remarkable example of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, preparing deliverables. Now we get sort of into the nitty gritty of, uh, of actually creating uh, materials, uh, creating press releases, social media pieces, preparing per, for a press conference. Again, these are skills that um, are, uh, you can learn them. Some people think that, and you can say like it's part science, part art, but you can definitely learn how to do these things and be competent with them. And you'll, you'll, you'll find a certain level of competence, again, even if you want to Google and find information on how to do this, you can, you can do that. There are templates out there. And I have to say again, this is something for those who want experience, who want uh, uh, help with that. We stand ready to, to deliver that thing. But um, make sure that, again, all your information, all your communications pass through those filters of honesty, transparency, and, and frequency. Um, everything should pass through those filters. If it doesn't pass through one of them, forget it. Drop that, redo it, and send it out again. Um, reviewing with your legal team, uh, stakeholders, um, legal team and stakeholders, uh, report relevant information to executives and decision makers. Again, don't hold back. There may be a tendency to, to wanna say, well, this guy doesn't need to know, or we don't wanna deliver bad news because 
the board was, uh, co- there was contention on the board before this, and now this is going to make it worse. This is not the time to address things in that way when you have a crisis situation. Um, all information needs to be given to executives and to decision makers so that everybody has, everybody has an opportunity to weigh in, uh, to contribute. And also, again, you don't know who's going to ask any person who's uninformed a question. The last thing you want is someone out there armed with an opinion or a guess. You know, those are two very, very uh, uh, potent hand grenades to, to put uh, into anybody's hands in a time of crisis when communications is so critical, especially when you have so much disinformation. Now, think about COVID-19. Is it good to wear a mask? Is it not good to wear a mask? You'll have a policy and that person gives their opinion. Yikes. Okay, so again, I think it's uh, pretty pretty straightforward. As far as the legal team is concerned, um, again, uh, you may have legal a team that you work with normally. You may have in-house counsel. Uh, you, with your organization, will know how you work and how you interface with uh, the legal profession. What I always say is to give a shortcut to this is that uh, the the legal eagles can perform two services for you. They can be your sword and they can be your shield, and you need to be. Uh, cognizant of which one you want them to be. And you probably want them to be competent with both. You want them to be able to, as a sword, be able to, to, to attack anyone who's giving false information, to, to, to get rid of that, to be able to get you into the right situation, saying the right things, making sure that you're in line with code and that sort of thing, that you're legal in what you're saying, literally. Um, and as a shield to block any sorts of uh, claims against you that may come, as I can, some people may take it personally, like in a cybersecurity issue, um, people are going to come after you. You lost my information. What if they start, you know, the, the litigation train? Um, that's where your legal team has to know everything, consult with them, give them the opportunity to do their job, because if you're engaging them, I'm sure you're paying them quite a bit of money because that's what they do. Um, let's see. Oh, and deliver uh, the deliverables. Uh, And that just means be reliable, essentially. And as we close, I think we have about five or 10 minutes. So I'll I'll uh, scoot through these next few. Um, Just just be be reliable. Um, Send out your press releases on a regular basis. Make them predictable. Make at least one thing predictable, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly. Make it predictable so people will know that it's coming and you're positioned as a promise keeper as far as that's concerned. And you can send things with other frequencies if you want to, but with some things, try to establish a metronome of information that's timely and responsible and true. And that will be greatly appreciated by all your constituencies. And uh, ensure that your spokesperson has a clear voice throughout your um, your deliverables. And uh, again, can be a CEO, can be uh, a director of communications. Uh, there's, no, there's no set answer, no right answer to that. Whoever is best at it. And um, if you don't have somebody you feel is good at it, you know, again, we can, we can help you with that. There's, there's help available. Okay. And let's see, I'm going to uh, monitor for additional coverage and responses. Look at the social conversation. Again, we're using social media. So check it out. If you're going to be in that world, you know that it's all about timely response. You put something out there, you're going to get likes, dislikes, comments, that sort of thing. It's a very immediate format. So you need to be ready to respond to that. Um, in a very immediate fashion. Check for spikes in media coverage. Um, get yourself registered on Reddit. There are services that you can subscribe to that will alert you whenever your name or your organization's name is used in media coverage. Um, those are useful tools and you can consult someone about that, how to, how to get uh, subscribed in those things. Um, respond uh, when and where appropriate. You don't have to respond to every little thing. You know, again, there's some tinfoil hat stuff out there sometimes that, uh, you know, you don't have to respond to every single thing. But I think some of those things that uh, that you can take a pass on will be re- readily evident. But that's what sharing your information with other people will help you to recognize. Um, reassess the situation at some point. Be sure to take a breath and ensure that, ensure that when the crisis is contained uh, and you have some of these processes in place, I think that's what I mean by containment, and you're actually working to control um, the tide here of information and and the circumstances, take a breath and assess what you're doing and uh, consider reaching out to journalists and influencers to, to help mitigate the crisis. Again, reaching out to people and help use your Rolodex, you know, in these situations um, to, to, to get people to, to, to help you uh, with these things. But again, 
don't do it as a one-off. Don't do it as a skunk works type of thing. Make sure that everybody knows, you know, what's going on. Instead of like, my, my cousin, Vinny, he's going to help us with PR. You know, you, you got to make sure that everybody's on board with this thing. Um, and lastly, uh, performing a, a, po a post-mortem. Um, once the crisis is over, um, having honest analysis about where you did well and where you didn't. You know, some things were effective, some things weren't. Um, be honest about it. Again, in high functioning organizations, it's very easy. They do that very easily and honestly and um, effectively. Some organizations need some help with that. And um, again, as Board Veritas is one of the things that we do. We can help you uh, to mediate and, uh, and moderate those, those discussions to make sure that they're effective and you come out of it um, better than you were before and knowing that you have to set out a plan uh, for future events because uh, anything that happens gets added to the story. You know, whenever you take that book out, something else, another page goes in it and, uh, and you put it back on the shelf for use the next time. Okay, next slide. And crisis as opportunity. Um, and this sounds a, a little predatory somehow when you say it, that the crisis is opportunity. We're taking advantage of a bad situation. And um, we want to say taking advantage, would you say maybe making use of? Um, look, uh, change creates the opportunity. It's, it's change. Crisis is a kind of change. It's a stark and shattering and shocking type of change, but it is change. Uh, so we want to take this opportunity to say, all right, is this an opportunity that we can actually increase our donor base? Because it's a challenge. If it's a medical challenge and COVID-19 gives us an opportunity to say, wow, you know, hey, COVID-19 affects our constituency. Can you help us? Can you give that extra dollar now? Because it's needed more than ever with a very carefully and um, I'd say coherently uh, uh, crafted message that has, again, that sense of empathy, that sense of caring. Don't be crass about it, but it may give you an opportunity to, to ask in a way that you haven't asked before and give it, the situation may give people the impetus to give in a way that they've never uh, felt before, uh, gave before, but you've given before, but you, you have to ask first. Um, becoming a trusted source of information. This could be highly valuable. Um, when people are coming to you and recognize you as a source of information, we talked about an example where um, some of the organizations may be the sole source of information for a particular, particular, particular disease, a particular condition. And um, when you have COVID-19 taking the attention of the medical infrastructure of the government infrastructure so completely and totally towards that one thing. Well, I still have my situation. I still have my physical problem. My daughter still has this issue. How do I get information from them? So you will be even more responsible than ever for providing information, guidance, and assistance uh, to these constituents. And if you do it effectively, the level of appreciation will be shown, uh, I think, tenfold. I think you'll be, you'll be very pleased by, by the response, both the personal responses that you get from people. I've, I've seen, you know, people who come in and give people, you know, a hug in tears and hugs, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you for being there for me. And then of course, you know, the, the donor base will, will respond as well with their gratitude and their recognition of your hard work at being a trusted source of information. And then we talk about the mother of invention. Well, well I guess the most um, obvious example is that we're all here on this, uh, on this Zoom webinar. I mean, how many webinars have been done, were being done uh, prior to, to COVID-19? It was a pretty rare thing, you know, pretty, a pretty uh, exotic animal uh, to do that. But now it's a staple and people are doing doctor's visits, you know, by, by Zoom calls and things like that. The whole, the whole world has changed. The medical profession has changed. Caregiving has changed. Fundraising has changed. So uh, this is just one obvious example. Uh, how, of how COVID-19 has been the mother, mother of invention. So uh, take the opportunity to see if technology, if this crisis uh, grafts uh, a, a technical capability that will help you into the future, um, communications uh, abilities that will take you into future, into the future, um, use this time as a time of growth for the organization. And that growth may help you to be uh, a much better and stronger organization as, as you come out of that crisis situation. Uh, next slide. Okay. Well, uh, I think that we got through that roughly on time. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want it to skimp too much. As I said, there was a lot to go over. Um, 
And I know that you probably have some questions. So if we want to do that right now, we can do that. Yeah, we have, uh, and thank you so much for this presentation. There was so much good information in there. Um, and, you know, if you want to do a weekend retreat, we will have you <laughs> <laughs> on crisis communication. We had, a, we had really good chats coming through from all the individuals uh, in, the, in attendance um, about their specific crises, mm -hmm. um, crises around um, – race relations in America, crises around when their communities pass away and they have leftover donations of medical supplies. Um, so there, there are some really specific crises. One question though that I think, and we only have time for one um, before wrapping up, but this one question okay. I think is good for everybody. And it's specifically, when the audience is limited, is a press release wise? If the audience is, is limited, um, you know, a press release really refers to a, a, for, a particular format that uh, the media is expecting when organizations deliver information to them. So they don't have to think about where to look for it. So it's a, it's a format for who's sending it, what it's about, what's the issue, who do I get in touch with if I have questions. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a press release. The information that's in it is really the, the, the heart of the message, obviously. So if there's a small, and again, small is relative, if there's a, a smaller focused uh, group of people that you're trying to get in touch with, a personal letter can sometimes be better than a press conference because it's more intimate. Um, it's, it's more personal and it, it seems more directed you know, uh, towards those people rather than to whom it may concern, which is sort of the, uh, the, the, the feeling that you get from a, from a press release. So again, I would say if you're delivering to news organizations, a press release is the format they're going to expect. If you're delivering to members, constituents, employees, that sort of thing, I would consider a, a personal letter and uh, the signature is always a nice touch rather than you know, for, for more information contact. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have just three minutes. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for the presentation, what you shared. As you were sharing, I was thinking about the National Organization for Rare Disorders and how we manage crisis control and, and uh, thinking specifically, we have a staff of uh, 50 people and uh, it just makes me think like we do a lot of the, all of those things. We do a lot of them and, and I'm curious, uh, you know, and I'm going to talk to our communications team, but I remember when I first started working at Nord, they said, don't talk to the media. <laughs> it was part <laughs> of our training. They're like, you don't talk to the media. And that's, like you said um, in another conversation, you know, preparation is critical because when a crisis happens, if your staff and your board are not prepared, people haven't been told. You can't blame them for talking to the media if you never That's told right. them. And That's nobody right. expects a crisis. Nobody expected a pandemic. And so, you know, if you want to prevent the crisis from getting worse, talk to people before the crisis. And so in our training, they're like, you don't talk to the media. What happens when a reporter calls? We were all told if a reporter calls, you patch them through and they're going to be aggressive and they're going to tell you, I have a deadline. I need to talk to you. And like, I'm not the person you talk to. So I loved your presentation. It just reminded me of the things that Nord does. Outstanding. Yeah. Um, again, it's having a, having a policy and sticking to it is a thing. And that all comes from preparation. You're absolutely right, Debbie. Well, we are so grateful to have you. Um, you are welcome anytime uh, in, in the future to continue uh, crisis communications. Maybe we can take it to the next level of crisis communications 202. Um, grateful, so grateful to have you. Um, Allie, if you could hit the next slide, we can talk just a little bit um, about what this rapid response leadership series is up to next. Um, we have a leader round table on virtual platforms for engagement on Monday. Email membership at rarediseases.org if you're interested. And then we have our grand finale, which will bring the Dear Abby or the Savage Love or the Nonprofit Whisperer. Um, and that is uh, Joan Gary. And she's talking about building a village, re-engaging your board members when they're experiencing burnout. That's July 8th. So that's our Rapid Response Leadership Series webinar. Um, and we are so grateful to have Michael here. This is um, has been a really great hour if you have any questions, please email membership at rarediseases.org. 
And thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.